Now, when you guys are taking the exam, a lot of the questions have multiple parts. My advice to you for both A, ease of migrating, and B, ease of your answering, write down everything in, start it off bulleted. So as in like, write your answers initially as outlined. So make sure you're answering the first part of the question, second part of the question, third part of the question, and then elaborate to make sure you're answering each part fully. Because there's obviously a lot of questions that are multiple parts. And so some folks will answer one of the two to four parts of that question perfectly. They'll do a great job, but they forgot the other two to four parts. So now their best case scenario is to get a five out of 10 on a 10 point question or only a 2.5. So make sure you, like I said, do kind of a bulleted or like an outlined approach to each answer. And that's fine. I'm not looking for an essay with a bunch of fluff. I'm looking for just facts and information. So and mostly application of your knowledge. So what I want you guys to go ahead and do is make sure that you're writing everything out. You are trying to be succinct, but you're really making sure that you're fully answering the question. You have your book, you have all of the lectures, you have all of the slides, you have all of your notes. It's a take home final exam. It's, I think it's a lot of fun. And if you understand it, it should be pretty easy. If you don't understand it and you're not able to apply it, it is going to be very, very difficult. Um, but I am very biased because I wrote it. So of course I think it's awesome and I think it's fair and easy. Um, obviously that's very much so built upon my own perspective, which once again has its flaws. So what are the questions you guys have? That's also sitting in Blackboard staring at you. It's called Altered Carbon. Is there any material you guys would like to review? Okay, so when it comes to muscle physiology, and I'm imagining you have this in respect to the take home assignment that you guys were doing, is it's not just about fiber type. You're going to then talk about obviously how much hybrid fibers exist. You're gonna talk about the mitochondrial density. You're gonna talk about all of the different enzymes related to the different energy systems. You're gonna talk about the storage of the different macronutrients inside of the muscle, which in turn is gonna help its performance. You're gonna talk about satellite cells around the muscle cell and how they're gonna be effective. Capillarization, now we're getting into more of the cardiovascular phys, but that is gonna be a component that's important. Along with, you're probably going to have to, yeah, maybe touch a little bit on the neurological side, recruitment patterns and so on. But now we're getting, obviously that's more into the neurological, but it still is an important feature to make sure that you're effectively bringing up. Yeah, so, Guys, don't worry about memorizing the individual enzymes. You're going to lose your mind. In theory, this should have been covered in physiology and just bi basic biology in high school, but we're all in different spots. So when we're talking about any of those energy systems, whether we're talking about glycolysis, beta oxidation, and then obviously when we're talking about glycolysis, we have our aerobic and anaerobic glycolysis. Beta oxidation is always aerobic, and we have our ATP PCR. Now, ATP, PCR, the only enzyme in there is creatine kinase. So if we got a greater amount of creatine kinase, we're going to be able to blow through our creatine phosphate faster, which is a good thing when it comes to energy production. 
but obviously it's not giving us a lot of endurance. We then have the enzymes related to our glycolysis. And the major rate limiter one is probably gonna be more of phosphofructokinase, PFK. If we have higher levels of that, we're gonna be able to go through glycolysis a lot faster. When we're looking at the citric acid cycle, which remember is shared in common between uh, aerobic glycolysis and beta oxidation, those are going to be citrate synthase and succinate dehydrogenase. Those are the two major rate limiting enzymes inside of the citric acid cycle. So if we increase the number of that, the process is going to be able to go faster. We're going to be able to turn over more energy aerobically, irregardless of our fuel source. And so those would probably be the ones that know. Myokinase is an important one because remember that takes two ADPs and converts one back into an ATP and the other into an AMP. So it's another way to kind of help a little bit with our shortest of energy systems, but it's not something that's going to really help enhance your performance when we're talking about any type of aerobic endeavor required for the athlete. So when you're thinking about muscle physiology, try to picture it in your brain. Try to think about you know, what the muscle fiber itself looks like, all those individual sarcomeres. Uh, in fact, Titan in theory actually has an elastic component to your muscle cells, not to mention the costumer and the distro, uh, dystrophin complex. Um, if you've got effectively different expression of Titan, in theory, you can have a different effect of elastic recoil inside of that muscle, which I mean, that's pretty cool. But on top of that, we are going to be looking at, okay, we can only fit so much inside of the sarcolem the, the cell membrane. So if we're going to really increase our storage of glycogen, of fatty acids, increase our mitochondria, naturally that means if we're looking at the size of the muscle, less of it can actually be the true sarcomeres or what is referred to sometimes as myofibrillar hypertrophy, which is the actual part that's allowing us to contract the muscle. So we're going to have a much better aerobic capacity, but like per cross-sectional area, we're just not going to be as strong. Um, the muscles can be, able, the fiber, if we're having the same level of strength as someone else is actually going to be a little bit bigger. And this is part of the argument, which is on the sarcoplasmic hypertrophy, when you increase the glycogen, which increases your water retention and the enzymes related to energy production, increases the size of the muscle cell without really increasing the strength as much. Whereas myofibrillar is where you're just increasing the amount of sarcomeres. So you're not really helping improving your endurance performance, so to say, but you are improving your body's ability to effectively produce force, produce power in a shorter period of time. So arguably each of those adaptations are gonna be specific to one realm, but to be fair, myofibrillar hypertrophy and sarcoplasmic hypertrophy definitely probably happen. Um, the key is how we can really emphasize one over the other and what the research is really gonna shake out over the long term what's going on there. We still got a ways to really understand it fully. So does that answer your question, Braden? So if we increase our mitochondrial density, we're now, that's also where all of our aerobic processes happen, AKA the citric acid cycle and the electron transport chain. Also remember we have that wonderful protein myoglobin that's gonna deliver that oxygen from the bloodstream to the mitochondria. So if we can increase the amount of mitochondria per muscle fiber, we're gonna have a much greater ability to maintain aerobic performance. So if you could just magically just snap your fingers and double your mitochondrial density in every single muscle in your body, you would still need to increase your capillary density and your ability to vasodilate to those capillaries. But while you would have an amazing aerobic capacity, especially even when you're doing things that are really high power. So when you're doing your maximal sprints and otherwise your maximal sprinting endurance will probably go up uh, to a certain extent but you would also increase the amount of mitochondria, which once again, have weight and take up space. So you're losing a little bit. It's, it, therein lies one of the things conceptually when you're thinking about the human body is quite frequently, I think of it like a car in that you, if you wanna have a car go as fast as possible, okay? What type of car is that? So like a car that's just, it's built purely for speed. And we'll even say purely acceleration to that top speed. What's, what's that car gonna look like? No, 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 you can actually name the vehicle or name the type of vehicle. 
that's the energy system you're going to definitely be operating in. Absolutely, Zach. None of you guys ever seen a drag racer, drag car? Okay. Please put up, if you don't know what a drag car is, please put that up in the, uh... oh, interesting. I guess somebody hasn't seen a drag car before. All right, give me a second. We're gonna use the powers of the Googles to help ourselves out. Oh, for sale. Well, no, I'm not going there. All right. So, way to let that Kentucky fly there. So, Ian, this is what a drag car looks like. Okay. So how well do you think these really high top end drag cars handle? That's okay, Ian. Exactly, they're not built for handling. They're built for maximal speed, very little change of direction. And that's what we're really looking at when we're talking about a track and field 100 meter sprinter. Not to say that they can't turn and change direction, but it's not the same goal, okay? Now, if we had to think of a car example of effectively what a long distance athlete is, what's our goal there? Yes. Yeah, it's going to be a hybrid car. It's going to be something where we're using as little fuel as possible and trying to be as efficient as we can be. Okay. Now, your average American is more or less, hmm, probably be like a dump truck. A lot of weight, not a lot of horsepower, definitely can't handle very well. But it's all about efficiency. So if you look at stock cars, and just so we can help Ian out, because not everybody's on that level. A stock car, if you actually look inside of them, are stripped down to where effectively you have as little as needed. You've got a seat, you've got a steering wheel, you've got a roll cage. You're trying to make that vehicle as efficient as possible. You're not trying to build it up to deal with a lot of collisions. You're not trying to build it up to try to deal with a lot of change of direction, but just enough and still a high speed output. So then, We have the demolition derby cars, where now you're talking about building up a greater amount of effectively, you know, steel frame and otherwise, so we can tolerate a greater amount of impacts. So an example of this would be really, if you look at something like a football player, you're trying to make sure that you've got enough muscle mass, fat mass to protect yourself, but still so that you can go ahead and perform. So that added weight means you're not going to be as fast as you probably could have been otherwise, but you're still going to be able to perform to a very high level. And then you can think about cars that are like effectively a tractor pull, where you're just looking for a huge amount of force, uh, or sorry, torque that you're able to produce in horsepower, but you're not worrying about top end speed. And that's probably going to be something that's a lot more like an offensive lineman, sumo wrestler. So I understand, obviously, the car analogy doesn't work perfectly for everyone, but what we're trying to keep in mind when we're looking at any athlete, which is, are we actually building up effectively, you know, are we trying to make this athlete as efficient as we can so they're gonna be able to perform as well as they can at their task? And obviously, you know, cars are fascinating because you see people make a lot of specific choices, which are fascinating because you see how they also eliminate certain things with safety and comfort just so they can get a little bit more performance. So does that make sense to you guys? Mm 
America. What are the questions you guys have? No worries, Braden. So when it comes to the way our blood is going to adapt to training, within about the first two weeks, we're gonna really increase our albumin, which is a certain protein that's important for osmolarity of our blood. This naturally is gonna pull more fluid into our blood, AKA increasing our blood plasma. Now, this increase in blood plasma is going to decrease our blood viscosity, which is going to help increase our cardiac output by also increasing our stroke volume because we're going to be able to fill the heart more fully and it's easier for the heart to pump that blood. Now, after about a month of hard aerobic training, you're going to have increased your red blood cell production thanks to the hormone erythropoietin uh, being produced by your kidneys and then obviously signaling on your bone marrow. Now, once we... <coughs> excuse me increase the red blood cell concentration, we in turn are going to now have a little bit better performance because we now not just increase our total blood volume, but our hematocrit is still a little lower than it was when we started, but it's much better. And we're going to in turn be able to have better outputs. You will be able to go back. You get the, I believe you get the exam all at once and then good luck. All right, guys, so we're going to go ahead and have ourselves a little um, essentially group activity for you guys to do. Okay, so we're going to divide you evenly into three separate groups. Okay, we're going to go ahead and just make it a triathlon. So we've got the swim, the bike, and the run. You guys are going to, in your groups, figure out all of the general cardiovascular adaptations you're gonna have from doing that, AKA all three groups should have this in common. And then you're gonna write the specific adaptations you're gonna get from just doing your modality. So group one, swimming. Group two is biking. Group three is running. Where are you going to see changes in the body's physiology cardiovascularly, okay? So there should be two parts of the cardiovascular system that are going to adapt in general. However, there's one that's only going to adapt specifically, and there will be still some variation between the bike and the run, even though the movement patterns are somewhat similar. So 
have fun, give you guys five, 10 minutes to go ahead and talk your way through it. And then we'll go ahead and go through it as a group. So have fun guys. And I will see you guys uh, just a little bit after two. Um, what you guys have there is good, but the profusion of blood around your lungs is gonna increase in general as your exercise intensity goes up. So the profusion is more down to gravity when you're at rest, you don't have as much cardiovascular output. And so you don't have the heart contracting as much intensity. So the upper third of your lung is not getting a lot of blood perfusion. The middle third is doing okay. And the bottom third is getting over perfusion effectively because gravity is pulling it in there. Now, as your exercise intensity increases, you're just pushing the blood through faster. So all areas are perfusion well. It doesn't matter what third we're talking about because when we lay down, now it's the bottom third for our torso, the middle third, and the top or third, the top third. I suppose right now we think third, third. It's just gonna be the same thing only around your side. Um, so yeah, you guys are definitely hitting the general part, which is the heart is going to positively adapt from any type of road training you do, along with so will the blood. Good. Good, and then Ian, I take it you guys were in the, uh, you guys in the bike or the run? Yeah. Good job. You'd also probably see a slight increase in your hip flexor hamstrings. That's actually help you pull your leg up and your glute is helping you push down, but good job there, guys. Good. So I think two groups accidentally did, uh, <laughs> did the swim because remember guys the run was number three trending so i think you guys um yeah that's okay that's okay now the key difference that you would see between the runner and the biker is with the biker you've got a little bit more of just isometric aerobic capacity because you're just holding on to the handlebars whereas the runner you're having more isometric uh firing of the spinal erectors and effectively your cervical, well, it's really all of your erectors because you have to keep yourself upright. And not to mention you have that aerobic capacity of the arm swinging back and forth as you're running, which obviously is not gonna be anywhere near as much capillarization, increasing in type one fiber cross-sectional area. And otherwise you're gonna see in the swimmer's upper body and the muscles are obviously being recruited to a much different degree, but not bad guys, not bad. Any other questions, comments, concerns, anything else you guys wanna go through and chat about today? All right, guys, so thank you, Catherine, for giving me something back. Otherwise, since it's pretty quiet, stay safe out there, guys. Keep taking care of yourselves, and I will see you guys on Wednesday. It's going to be a review. Come with questions. If no one's got questions, we'll go ahead and call it a day. If you guys want me to run some scenarios, we can run scenarios. Otherwise, just make sure you guys are getting that lab done for Friday if you want to come in and do the lab yourself and borrow the gym wear and do the lost base stuff. You guys are more than welcome to. Um, otherwise, stay safe out there, and I will be chatting with you guys more soon. So, bye-bye.